Cities After is a bi-monthly podcast about the future of cities. Grounded in our daily urban struggles, it is part dystopian and part utopian. My intention is to entice your civic imagination into action, because we know that a more just and sustainable urban future is possible. This is Miguel Robles Duran, and I dare you to imagine our cities after. COVID, COVID. global warming, Extract. gentrification, Exploitation. homelessness, Neophagic. racism, colonialism, patriarchy, hunger, police, brutal, delivery, private property, capitalism. capitalism. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. In this episode, I will talk about the outmoded forms of knowledge that architecture and related urban design disciplines uphold. This is as global populations face ever-growing social and environmental urgencies in their cities. To give up all existing and future urban land to developers and landlords is without doubt to surrender all of society's elementary sheltering needs to the one privileged class of speculators. I believe that this was one of the greatest urban tragedies of the last uh, years of the 20th century, which is the pervasive naturalization of private property rights over the housing rights of most of the world's population. Now, Despite this tragedy, the 20th century actually saw for a brief period some kind of social dictates of many modern states that were in favor of guaranteeing a large portion of urban land to the control of public entities. And this was, in theory, supposed to be for the purpose of benefiting society at large. I have no doubt that this direction was swayed by many of the contentious arguments that preceded these actions, and that is in the 19th century, middle of the 19th century, early 20th century, that were uh, debated against private property by a lot of influ influential figures, such as Proudhon, Marx, uh, and Bakunin. These people, together with many others, including a lot of massive social movements, constructed the basis of what we now refer to as the historical international urban struggles, and definitely marked that period. These urban struggles were aimed to confront many state policies with a lot of active experiments in other forms of land tenure that go beyond the idea of private property. I believe this was the period that gave rise also to the idea of social property that I define by the appearance of many variations of housing cooperatives, living communes, squatting collectives, common spaces, and public land that was reserved for its enjoyment and use by all citizens alike. It is under these political conditions that architecture, planning, and their connected urban disciplines were at last beginning to contribute to a restructuring of space that benefited most members of society. This was in sharp contrast to the previous centuries, where the purpose of these experts, namely architects, was to serve the will and desires of the landed elites. Perhaps the most notable historical example of architecture's consensual subservitude to the elites comes from the infamous architect of the Renaissance, Giovanni Battista Alberti, who in 1452 wrote one of the most influential books on architecture to date, titled De Reedificatoria, or on the art of building. In this book, Alberti advises his architecture students to the following, and I quote, Concern yourself for none but persons of the highest rank and quality, and those to such are truly lovers of these arts, because your work loses of its dignity by being done for mean persons. Do you not see 
what weight the authority of great men is to advance the reputation of those who are employed by them? And indeed, I insist the more upon this piece of advice. Not only because the world has generally a higher opinion of the taste and judgment of great men, but also because I would have the architect always readily and plentifully supplied with everything that is necessary for completing his edifice, which those of lower degree are commonly not so able and therefore not so willing to do. End of quote. From the 15th century until the mid-19th century, architecture's role to serve those of higher rank and quality, as Alberti puts it, was hardly questioned. It was until the first half of the 20th century that finally the idea that architecture could also have a social purpose began to proliferate around the world. This obviously coincided with the period of welfare state formation. For this short time or period, the proliferation of urban disciplines and their traditional services made total social sense. Democratic societies were envisioning a commonwealth project, and the trained technicians used their skills to help materialize its demands to the best of their disciplinary capacities. Progressively, a large number of architects and planners began to design spaces commissioned in the name of public good. Ethically, there was very little to question. These types of social commissions uh, were seen positively and they demanded no less than the envisioning of never before seen forms of public housing, public schools, public hospitals, open cultural spaces, community centers, transportation networks, and recreational infrastructure. The urban professionals who were actively taking part in these state-driven projects had actually very little reason to move outside the traits imposed by their disciplinary boundaries. In this case, public entities were taking care of all the other things that are necessary to make projects happen. Uh, in this case, I'm referring to the structuring of the economic part, of the political and social processes that are always needed to develop, manage, and sustain this kind of large public architecture projects. In short, the production of a socially just urbanity demanded uh, the design and coordination of incredibly complex processes where the architect, designer, or planner just played the singular and specific role of giving physical form to them. One could say that there was a clear social relevance in the tradition of urban disciplines, which for a very, very brief period could have also been seen as analogous to any respected form of social service. So yes, architects had a favorable social view during that time. Sadly, this time was not long enough as the post-war 20th century ideals gradually morphed into the consolidation of the global neoliberal project, first uh, with the election of Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom in 1979, and then soon followed by the election of Ronald Reagan as the President of the United States in 1981. This is the moment that the active roles of architecture, planning, and design disciplines gradually returned to their original purposes those mentioned by Alberti, which were both a representation of elitist power and a sets of knowledge that effectively just aided in the concentration of individual wealth. So that sort of complex array of bureaucrats and public servants, public professionals that had once designed, coordinated and sustained many of the economic and political processes that supported the expansion of social property slowly gave way to the neoliberal. And this was the need to extract private rent from everything where human sweat is involved. Private property obviously was re-emphasized as the urban principle for economic growth. At that period, new political and financial instruments that could liberate property from public holding, so all the social property that was produced in that welfare period, 
needed to be liberated into speculative trade and those instruments needed to be designed and implemented. Very importantly, all the previous commitments to secure urban land for general social well-being had to be disregarded as inefficient and producing a damaging public debt. Not to mention also the idea that also proliferated at that time, which was that bureaucracy and public servants were tremendously inefficient for managing urban environments. During the neoliberal adjustment period, many states succeeded in this transition faster, of course, and others continue this tra trajectory at a very slower pace. But without doubt, all the world, in one way or another, has promoted the kind of speculation made possible by private property as the principal engine of economic growth. As I mentioned in one of my previous podcasts, we are surrounded with extreme urban crises from economic, environmental, social, health, etc. And this crisis happens while the economy adds 412 new billionaires just in the previous year. In this reality, private property, either temporary or permanent, is hardly questioned. Moreover, it is promulgated as the given natural law that establishes the ruling principles for urban ordering, growth, and landed wealth accumulation. In this reality, armies of urban professionals, from architects and planners to engineers and designers, work to give visual form to these principles while in the name of protecting society's universal consent for private property, the privileged class of speculators continue to design the urban processes that can guarantee its reproduction. This has been the critical failure in the social reproduction of space that will continue to define our urban futures. And it will do so unless we, the army of urban professionals, begin to infiltrate the political and economic decisions and the transformative urban processes that are normally out of the reach of myopic disciplinary knowledges. These knowledges have demarcated the so-called design specializations over the years. In September 15, 2008, I was sitting in an outdoor bench in El Giardini di Castello at the Venice Biennial of Architecture with an old friend the San Diego-based architect, Teddy Cruz. It was the opening week of the 11th International Architecture Exhibition, and we were just resting from our visit to the Arsenale, uh, which is known as the Biennial's main exhibition hall. Both of us were tired. Uh, my friend Teddy had spent the two weeks prior installing a project commissioned by the American Pavilion, and I had been doing the same for the Dutch Pavilion. The Arsenale is an ex-military building complex that was repurposed in 1999 to accommodate the rapidly growing demands uh, of the Art and Architecture International Exhibitions of La Biennale. The Arsenale is composed of different structures, including an imposing 316-meter-long building with uninterrupted interior space that since then has been used by the Biennale curators to showcase the latest trends and the new propositions of the most recognized names in the art world and architecture establishments. The 2008 curated spectacle was like no other before. It had become the ultimate confluence and consecration space for a particular breed of superstar architects their ideological regime, which was perfectly represented in the countless 3D models, life-size follies, 2D projections, virtual reality displays, sophisticated computer-assisted renders, and dramatic lighting arrangements. As I remember, it was indeed uh, quite an extravaganza to behold. The Arsenale had turned into a container display. Uh, and a display of the purest material desires of neoliberal ideology towards the built form of our cities. If international exhibitions of these kinds are supposed to showcase an era, Aaron Betsky, the biennial chief curator at that time, 
had certainly produced an almost perfect show. But by doing so, he also had surrendered the possibility of representing the dramatic social environmental conditions and contradictions of the neoliberal era, and obviously the work of its architectural army. Simply put, the exhibition was a static homage and celebration of the dominant present of capitalism and the complacency of the global architectural establishment to it. Without doubt, it had utterly failed to represent any alternatives, warnings, or any suggestive criticism to it. This is what I was discussing at that bench when I heard news of the sudden collapse of the fourth largest investment bank in the United States, Lehman Brothers Holdings Incorporated. Here at the bench, we were dazed from the fest of luxurious architectural objects, catering global elites, bewildered from the jubilee of unsustainable designs for our environment, and stunned from the complete lack of affordable and urgent propositions for the 99% of inhabitants of this planet. I was having all these feelings while the global economy was collapsing in direct response to the absolutely reckless production of the built environment that was glorified in the Arsenale at the Venice Biennial. In my mind, the connection could not have been more clear. The global architectural establishment had to share blame for this dramatic economic collapse. More so, those members that profited the most from the privatized and financed charades of the neoliberal urbanization scheme, such as ultra-famous architects uh, like Rem Colas or Frank Gehry or Saha Hadid or Peter Eisman, Santiago Calatrava, Elizabeth Diller, Jack Herzog, and the likes. All of these seemingly architectural superstars were displayed at the exhibition and they had to be, in my mind, implicated in the operations that led to the 2008 global financial crisis and, of course, the dire social consequences that resulted from it. By that time, my work as a designer had already been centered against the political complacency of architects. But that Monday of September 2008 became, without doubt, the day of my final disenchantment with the architectural discipline at large. Fast forward to 2021, and now Cohabitation Strategies, which is the design cooperative for social spatial development that I co-founded as a response of the 2008 financial crisis, was invited to exhibit at the Arsenale at the 2021 International Exhibition of the Venice Biennial. This year, the title of the biennial was How Will We Live Together? which obviously gave a sense that the direction of urban disciplines was changing again towards the imagination of some form of global good. One of my main objectives to start a design practice uh, was to critically and actively challenge the current condition of how cities were made. And I wanted to respond to an urgent need to envision socially relevant modes of operation in the city. The collapse of Lehman Brothers in September 2008 had given me and my partners the final nudge that made us realize that a different kind of urban practice was urgently needed. But as I was strolling through the exhibition spaces of what is arguably the most influential international exhibition of architecture and its urban related disciplines, I could find very little signs of an urgent shift towards social and environmental justice ideals. As a matter of fact, uh, the majority of the projects exhibited at the biennial were made to reproduce and represent, as Alberti would say, the weight and authority of great men and those of rank and quality, or as the ones we refer in our times as the elites of global capitalism. You could see there projects that were reflecting the desires of the likes of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk 
to colonize other planets with their own views and visions. You could see projects celebrating artificial intelligence and an ultra high tech robots as a cost effective and efficient replacement of human labor in the built environment. There were quite a few of those. You could also find environmentally friendly propositions that were actually very popular. Everything eco, eco-friendly, sustainable. However, as expected, uh, most of these propositions fell short to crowd pleasing greenwashing. Uh, things like energy conservation or recyclable materials or sustainability principles, etc. Uh, were there, yes, but with little or no mention of capitalism and, of course, its dire consequences on the environment and no mention, of course, of who owned the resources and, most importantly, who owns the city and who are the people backing such greenwashing directions. In short, seldom a few exhibits that addressed urgencies such as the Palestinian crisis or the collectivized or community-led design processes that are happening in different places around the world, such as in Africa uh, or South America. The 2021 Venice Biennial was not that different from the Venice Biennial in 2008 that I just talked about. 13 years had passed since the collapse of Lehman Brothers, and I am even more sad to say that my disappointment with architecture and its related design disciplines is now even lower than what it was in 2008. This is enough for me to declare that architecture, urban planning, urban design, landscape urbanism, landscape design, etc. are outmoded disciplines that as they stand have little or no relevance to the progressive desires of the many of us that can still imagine the possibility of a better world. Those disciplines have, in essence, always belonged to the likes of Alberti or the many contemporary reincarnations that he has had. Every country has at least one of those architecture superstars that help sustain and reproduce this canon. And every country has its own supreme centers of architectural education that also help the reproduction of this canon. What I'm trying to say with all of this is that a completely new and parallel form of urban practice is needed. Urban practice needs to be completely redefined in order to co-produce spaces where people can reproduce themselves, their cities, and their livelihoods. I'm convinced that it is possible still to imagine new forms of living, even within the oppressive capitalist context that many believe we cannot escape and thus surrender to. In the West, since the early 20th century, urbanization has gone through two main general paradigms. First, the transfer of public power, money and resources to the government for it to decide on how its citizens should live. And this is the direction that I categorized before as the welfare uh, state formation, the time when architecture had some social relevance. The other paradigm, which is the current paradigm, began when the transfer of public power uh, of money and resources shifted towards private corporations, private developers, and the finance industry in general. This paradigm can be referred to as the neoliberal paradigm. I honestly think that a new paradigm is due and one that ultimately trusts in the slow grassroots formation where the transfer of public power, money, and resources is funneled back to the collective enterprises and give them the right to build the city as their hearts desire. This is a dramatic shift that we all should be moving towards. There was a time where governments made all the decision when they had the welfare power to conceive, according to them, what was social good. And citizens just responded by occupying the spaces designed by those governments. Our current times are designed and envisioned by the capitalist elites of the world. 
all the type of urbanization that we have seen since the 1980s, the skyscrapers, the luxury towers, uh, luxury housing buildings, transit-oriented development projects, mass infrastructure, public-private consortiums, etc. That type of urbanization needs to disappear. And so we have two options. One is what the majority of socially conscious servant planners and architects are currently pushing towards, which is uh, regression and translation into the present of the principles that gave rise to the welfare state, meaning there is still a very strong desire for having the public, in this case represented by a democratic government, to decide and to share the wealth in a more just form. There are calls for the development of more public housing, of more public parks, of more public spaces, of more public infrastructures, and those would be somehow structured by the governments that are redistributing the wealth into the territory. The other option, which I find is the most transformative option, is the one that I just mentioned as the new paradigm, is how can we all work towards some type of public organization, collective organization, or collectivized organizational forms that could take the power of decision from the government and have the government just be the one that distributes resources to those powers of collective and the powers of collective be the ones that manage it and structure the way they want our cities to reproduce. So this is taking away the decision power that welfare states had over the territory and giving it to people. In order for urban disciplines to be socially relevant again, they have to radically transform into the many roles that the early 20th century alliance of public servants performed. Urban practitioners have to be able to coordinate communities, design economic models, write and advocate for new policy, bend property laws, develop new property models, train inhabitants, defend vulnerable dwellers, and co-create new community management systems. All of this has to be done before thinking of the physical representation that architecture tells us to do. Why? Because all of these are the processes that allow the production and sustainability of more just urban environments. And most states have stepped back from performing this social role. Today, the disciplinary precise ways of practicing are just helping consolidate the expansive visions and territorial expressions of the greatest dispossession of wealth in history. For those of us with a stronger socially minded consciousness, it is time to rethink what a professional practice should do in the contemporary urban context. This against everything existing. This was another episode of Cities After. Thank you for listening and don't forget to subscribe.